Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. We appreciate you taking time to participate in this public meeting regarding a National Register Historic District in Wallingford. I would also like to express gratitude from Historic Wallingford for the support of Fort Culture and the many neighbors and friends who give so generously. Um, we definitely want to also thank, you, thank and welcome Michael Hauser, the state architectural historian who has been guiding us and advising and assessing this nomination. Uh, and also for Culture uh, is a King County cultural funding agency and has partially funded this nomination effort. For Culture supports the preservation of the historic places that give King County character. We also wanna welcome and thank Spencer Howard and Katie Pratt from Northwest Vernacular. They will be leading this meeting um, and will lead the way in completing the nomination. Wallingford has one of the largest collections of early 20th century residential architecture in Seattle, and especially those of the arts and crafts movement, idiomatic of America. I am a board member of um, Historic Wallingford and I uh, moved into Wallingford 25 years ago bought a very ramshackle house at the time. They can still be found in the neighborhood as well. Fixed it up and during that time fell in love with the architecture that was born in America of the arts and crafts movement. I had no idea um, how interesting it was and how many different facets and also how we're finding fewer and fewer places that continue to preserve this architecture. Um, I also want to, why do these places such as Wallingford, um, why is it important to try and save these places? Is because they uh, serve as physical memories of a neighborhood and become a part of the identity of those who appreciate the historic fabric of Wallingford. The host of this event, Historic Wallingford, is an all-volunteer organization that was formed in 2017 to be a neighborhood resource and to carry out activities such as walking tours, workshops, and other events that would help raise awareness and appreciation of the history of the architecture in Wallingford. In line with this mission, last year we launched the research for our National Register Historic District, District and you will learn more about this this evening. Um, we hope to advocate for Wallingford by supporting the premise of UW Professor Catherine Rogers Merlino, which is to promote the historic fabric in the neighborhood and work to accommodate growth with additional dwelling units that can blend in with the existing heritage homes. Developing a National Register District is hard work. It takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of community support. We would love to nominate other areas in Wallingford in the future, but we'll need additional leadership and support to make that happen. Historic Wallingford has no plans to seek a City of Seattle landmark or conservation district. We're holding this meeting to share with you the workings of the National Register Historic District nomination and what we expect the steps to be. A second meeting, uh, um, an additional meeting will be held uh, at the conclusion of the nomination report. Um, the historic district process started with a feasibility study conducted in the summer of 2019 by volunteers organized by the historic Wallingford and led by professional preservation consultants, Northwest Vernacular. The study identified four areas in Wallingford that are potentially eligible as National Register Historic Districts. The report is on our website, historicwallingford.org, and we opted to begin research in areas with the highest concentration of older, intact properties for National Register Historic District. As part of this research, our volunteers collected information about the people who lived in Wallingford, including their origins, occupations, from roughly 1900 to 1940. And a picture is emerging of what life was like in this working class neighborhood during the early 20th century when much of the neighborhood was developed. This development was driven by such activities as the Yukon Pacific Exposition, trolley line expansion into the suburbs of Seattle and industrial development on the North Shore of Lake Union. And the culmination of this project will be a rich document that anyone can access to better understand the history of the neighborhood, buildings, residents who lived here, and commemorate arts and crafts architecture. Thank you again for joining us. Spencer Howard and Katie Pratt from Northwest Vernacular will now give information on the nomination and discuss some of their findings so far. John, wonderful. Thank you so much for the introduction. 
Um, for everyone attending, uh, please note that we are recording this meeting. Um, copy will be provided on Historic Wallingford's uh, website. Uh, for panelists, just a reminder to keep your video turned off, except when presenting or speaking, if you want to turn it on or not. Um, with that, uh, welcome to the second of two public meetings related to the development of this National Register Historic District nomination. The goal of this meeting is to share the draft nomination and background. Uh, we will address questions specific to the nomination um, at the end. So as John mentioned, the project is uh, sponsored by Historic Wallingford, uh, funded in part through a Four Culture Preservation Special Projects grant uh, to support the broader demographic analysis and informational maps drawing on census records from 1910 to 1940. Um, funding for the National Register nomination preparation comes from Historic Wallingford. So as a brief introduction, the National Register of Historic Places is the official federal list of districts, sites, buildings, structures, and objects significant in American history, architecture, archeology, span engineering, and culture. To qualify for listing, a property must possess historic significance, have a story to tell, and integrity, be able to physically convey that story. A district possesses a significant concentration, linkage, or continuity of sites, buildings, structures, or objects united historically or aesthetically by plan or physical development. The four criteria used in evaluation are A, to be associated with important events that have contributed significantly to the broad pattern of our history. B, to be associated with the lives of persons significant in our past. C, to embody the distinctive characteristics of a type, period, or method of construction or represent the work of a master, or possess high artistic values, or, and this is key, represent a significant and distinguishable entity whose components may lack individual distinction, or under D, to have yielded or may likely to yield information important in prehistory or history. So it's important to note the last portion of Criterion C, resources that represent a significant and distinguishable entity whose components may lack individual distinction, are called districts, and not every property within a district must be architecturally significant. Uh, the Wallingford uh, Meridian Streetcar Historic District is significant under National Register Criteria A and C at the local level of significance in the areas of architecture and community planning and development. So the seven aspects of integrity evaluated are location, setting, design, materials, workmanship, feeling, and association. The boundary for the historic district is shown with the bold black line on the map and encompasses the area shaped by the underlying plats and unique connection to three streetcar lines during the period of significance and through the duration of most of the construction within the historic district. The following plats establish the distinct organizational framework for roads, blocks, and lots within the historic district. These plats, located at the then north edge of the city, benefited from proximity to the streetcar line along Interlake Avenue North at the west edge of the historic district and along the Meridian Line um, a half block south of the district along uh, north and northeast 45th Street, as well as proximity to places of employment. The distinguishing characteristics of block and lot sizes and near absence of alleys reflect the multiple development influences shaping the spatial character of the historic district and the transitional role of the 1891 Baltimore edition between the west and east platting patterns. So the period of significance ties in with historic events in the neighborhood, as well as physical construction of buildings and transportation networks. Period of significance is the length of time when a property was associated with important events, activities, or persons, or attain the characteristics which qualify it for National Register listing. Period of significance usually begins with the date when significant activities or events begin giving the property its historic significance. This is often a date of construction. So for this district, the period of um, uh, spans from 1900 to 1936. 
beginning with the construction date of the oldest extant property within the district, which is shown at left, and 4532 Corliss Avenue North, built circa 1900 and shown in the left photograph. It ends in 1936, the last year streetcars were the only public transit form servicing the district. Streetcar lines assessing the, uh, accessing the district begin to switch to motorized buses and trackless trolleys beginning in 1937, a transition that was completed throughout the city by 1944. Most of the construction within the historic district occurred within the period of significance as shown in this map. Uh, the purple properties being those built within the period of significance. Single and multiple family residential buildings comprise a defining characteristic of the historic district, reflecting architectural styles and kit houses popular in the Pacific Northwest during the first decades of the 20th century. The building forms, styles, and associated garages convey, convey the pattern of development and density associated with a period of intense growth in the city. This map shows current use patterns within the district. Single family are shown in purple and are the majority use. Multiple family are shown in red and are the next most numerous use within the district. Of note two are the dark green building footprints, which identify single family conversions to multiple family use. So houses in the older 1880s and 1890 plats in the west and central portion of the historic district span multiple lots, while houses in the east portion platted in the 1900s typically reside within a single lot. Houses throughout the district orient towards the street with a narrow front yard and modest to large backyards, depending on the house size. Houses are typically centered with their respective, within their respective parcels or placed with a narrow setback between adjacent buildings, characteristic of a denser urban setting. Due to the near absence of alleys, garages occur both in front of and behind houses. Single family house conversions to multiple family dwellings, both within and outside of the period of significance, provided an important mechanism for increasing density within the historic district. Census records from 1910 through 1940 indicate conversions within the period of significance started between 1910 and 1920, uh, increasing households to two or more from multiple houses within the district. Uh, building forms are single family and include more affordable and efficiently built forms such as Working Men's Foursquare, American Foursquare, or Bungalow. The single family forms relate to the prevailing styles employed in the neighborhood during the period of significance as well as national and citywide housing trends and the targeted role of middle-income home buyers in purchasing houses within the historic district. Building materials are primarily wood with um, wood frame construction, wood windows, siding, trim, porch and stoop elements. Brick and stucco are less common and mostly seen on chimneys. Multiple family buildings within the historic district are generally, generally located behind the commercial core along North and Northeast 45th Street with recent multiple family buildings also extending along Interlake Avenue North. The five low rise apartment blocks within the historic district are apartment buildings uh, that are two to three stories tall with single primary entrance for tenants and guests. They are built out to or near the lot lines and span multiple lots and are oriented towards the street. Examples are shown in the upper left and the lower right photographs. Each unit typically has its own kitchen and bathroom with units accessed from interior corridors. The main entry and lobby are often highlighted with a high level of ornamentation that is in line with the overall architectural style of the building. Most of these buildings have their own dedicated automobile garage located behind the building. Um, and these buildings really reflect or moderate to a high level of investment and were a popular multiple family building form prior to World War II. Um, building design and materials reflect the characteristics of the early use of the Tudor Revival style. Building materials are wood frame with brick veneer with some stucco cladding, wood windows, and wood stoop elements. Um, the courtyard type apartment uh, shown in the lower left photograph within the historic district 
Um, <clears throat> unlike the low-rise apartment blocks, does not have interior corridors. The apartment consists of two uh, one-and-a-half-story buildings arranged around a courtyard with eight living units per building, each with their own kitchen and bathroom. Each unit has front door access and a back door to the central courtyard and parking. Garages are separate and located behind the buildings. The buildings have an L-shaped plan that spans multiple lot, lots and are set back 10 feet from the property line, similar to the surrounding sing, uh, single family dwellings. The duplex example, the only example within the district is in the upper right corner. <clears throat> this building um, uh, is two stories with separate entrances for each of the living units. Uh, it's at 4546 4th Avenue Northeast and was built circa 1923. The building exhibits the same physical features and setback as single family dwellings within the district. So architectural styles, the <clears throat> application and often interpretation by contractor and builders of architectural styles convey pre um, prevailing um, national and citywide trends at the time of construction. In addition to adaptations to the socioeconomic conditions of building owners um, and the targeted home buyer preferences and, and um, um, uh, available standing. The high volume of buildings designed in the craftsman and classical revival styles uh, shapes the visual characteristics of the historic district. Colonial Revival, inclusive Dutch Colonial Revival, and Tudor Revival hold a secondary role in shaping the architectural character of the district. <clears throat> the Craftsman style is the most common style used within the district, with 305 extant buildings using the style. <clears throat> the first large-scale use of the style occurred in 1905, with 16 buildings completed. Uh, there followed a brief drop over the next two years, uh, and then the style peaked between 1909 and 1916, followed by another brief lull, and then the style returned to popularity again between 1918 and 1922. Um, use of the style, uh, based on extant buildings, tapered off to just one building built per year in the late 1920s, and by 1929 was no longer in use. The Craftsman style is the first major architectural style movement that originated on the West Coast. It dominated a residential architecture from 1905 until about the 1930s throughout the country. The Craftsman style embraced the idea that design should suggest the labor of a master craftsperson, so design elements associated with it are often derived from structural elements of the building. The style relies heavily on showing exposed framing, embracing heaviness of design elements such as box, po box posts, low-pitched roofs, and asymmetrical facades. Wood is the primary exterior cladding material with river cobble, stone, or brick utilized on porch supports and chimneys. The popularity of the craftsman and its associated bungalow form spread locally and nationally with the publication of plan books like Jed Yoho's Craftsman Bungalows, um, published in 1916. The classical revival style uh, with 106 extant buildings showcasing the style is the second most common style used within the district. The style came into use within the district as part of the first buildings built in the early 1900s and peaked in use between 1906 and 1912. A brief burst of use followed in 1915 um, with the style ceasing in use by 1924, except for one outlier in 1930. Classical Revival is a transitional architectural style um, popular during the early decades of the 20th century. It incorporates classical details on bungalows, four squares, and working men's four squares. These classical details include cornice or eave returns, classical columns or pillars, and modillions. The Classical re Revival houses may lack the symmetry that is typically seen on later colonial revival buildings. The Colonial Revival style saw moderate use within the district, with only 51 extant buildings built in the style. Use of the style within the district started by 1910, but was not consistent in popularity, with one to three, one to three buildings built each year, followed by zero um, use of the style for a couple years, and then another one to three buildings built in the style. Use of the style peaked between 1919 and 1925, 
um, with 12 built in 1924. So the colonial revival has been a popular architectural style in the United States, particularly on residential buildings. Um, the colonial revival houses imitate, but do not directly copy the federal and Georgian style buildings constructed during the United States early years. Uh, colonial revival houses typically feature symmetrical main facades, double hung windows, side gabled or hipped roofs, cornices with dentils and medallions, and prominent front entrances. Colonial revival houses may be two to two and a half stories or may be single story bungalows. The Dutch colonial revival style um, as shown in the lower right photograph is a sub, uh, subtype of the colonial revival and was used on 28 uh, extant buildings within the district. Um, it started in use by 1905 and continued with just a couple buildings built in the style every couple of years until it peaked between 1920 and 1923 with 18 built. Um, the style draws on late 18th and early 19th century Dutch colonial architecture from former Dutch colonies on the East Coast. In practice, within the district, the style generally applies to a colonial revival style building with a gambrel roof. And again, uh, wood is a primary exterior cladding material. The Tudor Revival style was used on 29 extant buildings within the district. Um, use of the style started by 1906 and continued with just a few buildings built each year. The style really peaked between 1925 and 1929 and saw a high vol volume of use on multiple family buildings, the low rise apartment buildings and the courtyard apartments. The Tudor Revival style loosely interprets the decorative elements of the Jacobean and Elizabethan buildings of the late medieval period in England and typically feature a dominant cross gable on the front facade, steeply pitched roofs, decorative half timbering, tall narrow windows often grouped, and massive chimneys. Gable details, um, <clears throat> patterned brickwork, and round or Tudor arches are also hallmarks of this style. The Tudor Revival is a variation of eclectic revival, and so other variations that you might have seen include uh, Swiss Chalet Revival, Mission Revival, and Spanish Eclectic. So the historic district exhibits integrity showcasing buildings constructed in a variety of styles within the period of significance. The green building footprints in the three maps um, at left show buildings with intact plans, windows, and casings. The dark blue footprints are buildings with extensive changes. So the location and design um, communicate the interrelated development pattern of historic contributing buildings and the underlying plot. The integrity of setting around the historic district has changed with the growth of the neighborhood's commercial corridor along North and Northeast 45th Streets, transitioning to single family buildings or transitioning single family buildings to commercial use and replacing them with low rise commercial buildings. Commercial development along Stoneway North has also replaced single family dwellings along the street. Within the historic district, the landscape character uh, retains integrity and, and general consistency with early 20th century residential subdivisions. The district retains integrity of materials and workmanship. Um, most of the buildings, uh, as evidenced in the uh, three maps, retain key exterior cladding and window materials uh, related to their original construction. The historic district retains a uh, remarkable um, integrity of feeling and association. The main architectural styles used, utilized in the historic district remain evident and provide a cohesive identity. Contributing buildings are those within the period of significance that retain integrity and convey the historical associations for which the district is historically significant. Non-contributing are those buildings that are either built outside of the period of significance, so 1937 or later, or have experienced um, substantial alterations to their exterior visual character. Part of the work in preparing the nomination was looking at each building to evaluate the level of window, cladding, and plan, um, plan changes. This assessment occurred from the public right-of-way since the visual character evident when walking or driving along the street is a measure of the integrity of feeling within the historic district.
This map shows in dark blue the contributing buildings and the non-contributing buildings are shown in yellow. So it kind of provides a sense that of the level of difference between the two and, and it does remain the majority of contributing buildings within the district. I'll hand over the presentation to Katie Pratt to take you through the history of the district. Thank you, Spencer. So now we're into the significant statement portion of the National Register nomination, which is the history section. I'm gonna outline how Wallingford and the district developed in the next several slides. Uh, but first I'm gonna go over the summary significant statement of the district and which National Register criteria we're looking at. Next slide, Spencer. The Wallingford Meridian Streetcar Historic District is significant under National Register criteria A and C at the local level of significance in the areas of architecture and community planning and development for the period of 1900 to 1936. As Spencer mentioned, this begins in 1900 with the construction of the oldest extant property within the district and ends in 1936, the last year streetcars were the only public transit form serving the district. Streetcar lines accessing the district began to switch to motorized buses and trackless trolleys beginning in 1937. A transition completed throughout the city by 1944. Furthermore, the historic district is significant as a streetcar suburb under the multiple property listing Historic Residential Suburbs in the United States, 1830 to 1960. The district is a residential neighborhood of contiguous residential subdivisions that are interrelated by their cohesive design. The majority of the properties constructed within the district were built after the arrival of the streetcar lines in the area and were in fact advertised for their proximity to public transit. The street features, mix of popular architectural styles, predominance of kit houses, and the clustering of apartment buildings on blocks closest to transit lines in the business district reflect this subtype of suburb. Next slide, Spencer. So the area that would become Wallingford was largely wooded until the late 19th century when development began primarily along the northern shores of Lake Union. The area shaded in gray on the screen was incorporated within the city of Seattle in 1891. The annexation launched platting activity between Lake Union and Green Lake, although development did not immediately follow. Between 1890 and until 1900, the area becoming Wallingford was considered quite affordable in comparison to prices in Queen Anne and Capitol Hill. A 1900 advertisement of real estate for sale indicated an entire block of 20 lots in the historic district's Lake Union second edition were priced at $1,200, while two lots in Queen Anne were $1,100, and three lots near 20th Avenue and East Madison Street on Capitol Hill were listed as cheap for $750. Next slide. Despite the intense plotting activity of the 1880s and 90s, the area remained relatively sparsely developed the further north from the shores of Lake Union you traveled. But by 1901, the Green Lake streetcar line extended north from downtown and looped around Green Lake. This line jogged to the east along North 45th Street to run north along Interlake Avenue North, which is the historic district's west edge. Real estate classifieds then advertised lots in the Lake Union second edition for their proximity to the new Green Lake line. The map on your screen is from 1905 and it's from the based real estate atlas and it shows approximately 70 buildings in the area. You can see the platted areas and the yellow building outline. You can also see that there were still large areas of acreage that hadn't been platted yet. During the first several years of the 20th century, development in the greater area included the construction of Interlake School in 1904, a half block from the district's southern boundary, which provided education access further north, demonstrating that the population was starting to move that way. Next slide, Spencer. In addition to the residences constructed, the Home of the Good Shepherd was established in 1907, uh, within the district, St. Benedict Parish was founded in the area in 1906 and began meeting in the district in 1907. Lincoln High School opened in 1907 just outside the district, uh, also demonstrating um, the need for nearby education access for residents as the population grew. Next slide. The arrival of multiple streetcar lines in the neighborhood stimulated additional platting and both residential and commercial construction in the area. 
the ease of access to the growing neighborhood also increased real estate prices. The Wallingford Avenue line began service in January of 1907, followed by the Meridian line in 1908, which was then extended in 1909. Also in 1909, the University of Washington hosted the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition World's Fair, and residents from Wallingford could easily ride the streetcar line to the university district. Other developments in the first decades of the 1900s within the larger neighborhood were the establishment of the Seattle Gaslight Company on Lake Union in 1906, and the dredging of the canal to connect Lake Washington, Lake Union, and Puget Sound between 1911 and 1917. Next slide. The historic district's location made it and the larger Wallingford neighborhood an ideal location for new construction in the quickly growing city. It was located on the main east-west thoroughfare between Ballard and Fremont to the west and the University District to the east, and it also adjoined the North Trunk Highway or Aurora Avenue to the west. Intense construction occurred in the area between 1905 and 1910, with four plots filed in the course of four years. The lots were advertised for their low price, views towards Lake Union and the University of Washington, and proximity to the university campus. Daniels University Grove, that plot, advertised its lots as fronting the Meridian Streetcar Line and for its pro close proximity to the university and area schools. These new plots, plus the establishment of neighborhood amenities and improvements, spurred on residential construction in the neighborhood. Next slide. In the midst of the historic district's growth, the city of Seattle established the Seattle Zoning Commission in 1920. The commission began surveying the city to report to city council on a recommended zoning or districting ordinance. Prior to this survey, there were a series of building ordinances that really focused mostly on fire pre prevention and establishing classes of buildings based on their building uh, tech construction techniques and materials. The city was then divided into those building districts based on those classes of buildings. But after the Zoning Commission completed their survey, City Council adopted Ordinance 45-382 in 1923, which divided the city into districts rather than just focusing on building materials. They also began regulating the use of heights, use, size of buildings, and uh, restricting the location of trades and industries. The 1923 zoning ordinance largely documented existing uses or at least building typology. Since we know that while the historic district had many residences constructed in single family form, the ordinance did not take into account single family residences that were used by multiple families. Over 75% of the historic district was constructed in or prior to 1923 when the ordinance was adopted and the land within the historic district was classified as within a first residence district with the exception of the home of the Good Shepherd, which you can see um, the diagonal hash marks in the map, which was classified as a second residence district. First resident districts allowed uh, single family dwellings, public schools, private schools, churches, parks and playgrounds, art galleries and libraries, private conservatories for plants, as well as railroad and shelter stations. Next slide. After the 1923 zoning ordinance was passed, the Wallingford Commercial Club did uh, petition the Zoning Commission to rezone part of the neighborhood to allow for additional apartment construction in blocks adjacent to 45th Street. Apartment buildings within the historic district were built between 1925 and uh, 29 and aligned with this effort to support increased density adjacent to the commercial core. By 1930, most of the available lots in the historic district had been built out and streetlights lit portions of the neighborhood. The community also petition, petitioned for additional access to downtown, wanting a new high bridge over the ship canal rather than another drawbridge like what we see in Fremont. Those efforts succeeded when the Aurora Avenue Bridge opened in 1932. And in the midst of bridge construction, City Council approved an extension of the Aurora Avenue Highway through Woodland Park, which opened in 1933. The completion of the highway along the west edge of Wallingford made the neighborhood more physically accessible. However, it spurred a shift in transportation away from the streetcars that had shaped the early development of both Wallingford and the historic district. Highway access to the neighborhood, along with the steady increase in personal automobile ownership and use, altered the landscape of the neighborhood and led to the decline and ultimately the end of streetcar traffic to and through the district and neighborhood. Next slide. 
In the midst of these transportation changes in the Great Depression, the historic district had an over 10% increase in the number of rental households from 22% uh, in 1920 to 33% 1930. Uh, the citywide rental rate in 1930 was just under 50% as a comparison. The US government had been encouraging home ownership to middle class families for years prior to the Great Depression, but it still remained out of financial reach for most urban and working class families and individuals. This was due to the fact that banks often required 50% down payment, interest only repayments, and repayment in full after five to seven years. Uh, under FDR, the Home Owners Loan Corporation, or HOLC, was established in 1933 which purchased mortgages on the brink of foreclosure during the depression and issued new mortgages that had longer repayment schedules and payments that included both principal and interest. The HOLC had lower interest rates and required borrowers to maintain regular payment schedules. So the HOLC was concerned about the risk of borrowers defaulting on their loans. They then incorporated an appraisal process in their lending practices requiring an assessment of the house for which the loan was being taken out the uh, condition of the surrounding neighborhood and neighborhood demographics, including race. They created color-coded or red line maps to demonstrate the quote unquote risk associated with loans in particular neighborhoods. Higher risk levels corresponded with areas having greater numbers of people of color and lower incomes. Congress then passed the National Housing Act of 1934, establishing the Federal Housing Administration or FHA, which insured bank mortgages. They continued the exclusionary practices of the HOLC and their appraisal process. The FHA determined that properties were too risky to insure if they were in racially mixed neighborhoods or even in white neighborhoods that were near uh, neighborhoods occupied by people of color um, because they could possibly integrate in the future. These practices encouraged the establishment of racially restrictive covenants to prevent neighborhoods from being redlined. Although it does not appear there were any formal restrictive covenants in the historic district, it is clear that de facto segregation was at play in Wallingford. Few, if any, individuals of color resided within the boundaries of the district, and the Wallingford area received a B or, quote, still desirable ranking on the 1936 residential security map. There were descriptions of varying lengths for each area on the map, and the one in which the historic district is located stated this. The residents are practically 100% American of moderate means with annual incomes of 1,500 to 3,000. The homes are both modern and seem modern in type with a sprinkling of old style residents. The district is predominantly residential in character and densely settled. It is a very popular district to desirable tenants and the permanent type of homeowners. The residences are being maintained in from fair to good condition. And so I took those annual incomes and ran them through an inflation calculator with the Bureau of Labor and Statistics. And the $1,500 to $3,000 in 1936 would be about $30,000 to $60,000 in today's dollars. Um, not every area on the security maps had um, income descriptions for the area, but the few on the Seattle maps that had um, the A or best rankings, some of them had income ranges and those were between 3,000 and 10,000 per year in 1936, which would be about 60,000 to 400,000 in today's dollars, just as a comparison. And those areas uh, with an A ranking were uh, a portion of Mount Baker, a spot in Queen Anne, uh, just a handful of areas. Next slide, please. The popularity of the car was apparent by the mid thirties as the streetcar lines began to be replaced by buses. Uh, discussion in the city about updating the transit system began in the 20s as the municipal railway system had substantial debt. These conversations gained traction in the 30s and um, trackless trolley and bus routes began to replace the older streetcar lines. The Green Lake line within the district was replaced by buses in 1937, followed by the Wallingford line in 1940 and the Meridian line in 1941. The transition to electric or motorized buses was completed in 1941 in the city when the last streetcar ran in the city. The car increasingly shaped the physical character of the commercial core along the south edge of the historic district and the surrounding Wallingford neighborhood in the post-war era. The commercial district began to increasingly cater to auto-oriented rather than pedestrian-oriented shopping and traffic, 
a Safeway store was constructed uh, on North 45th Street in 1941, just adjacent to the historic district, and it included an associated parking lot reflecting the desire of customers to drive to the store. And the status of North and Northeast 45th Street as an auto thoroughfare was cemented with the construction of Dick's Drive-In in 1954, their first stand in expanding local chain of restaurants, which is just outside of the historic district. Next slide. Land use, transportation, and population changes in the surrounding Wallingford and Seattle neighborhoods impacted the historic district in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And the financial losses of Boeing, a prime industry in Seattle in 1971, sent a ripple effect of population and income decline throughout the city, neighborhood, and historic district. City Council adopted a new city land use ordinance in 1957, repealing the 1923 ordinance, which we discussed. Uh, this new ordinance regulated use, height, size, location, as well as parking for buildings and structures, and also emphasized the importance of stable property values, which reinforced those exclusionary lending practices and also prioritized single family housing. Interstate 5 through Seattle opened in 1965 along the district's eastern edge, restricting Wallingford's access to the university district, which had originally been a selling feature in the neighborhood's infancy. The ease of access to freeways with Aurora Avenue or Highway 99 to the west and I-5 to the east made shopping and commuting outside of the neighborhood easier for residents. Residential construction remained minimal in the historic district during the post-war years with a few apartment buildings going up. Um, in sort of the baby boomer era, the University of Washington nearby faced a severe housing shortage and the value of Wallingford's proximity to the UW reemerged. Developers and property managers looked to surrounding neighborhoods like Wallingford to house students and many single family homes in Wallingford's neighborhood were converted to duplexes. Property owners within the neighborhood did push back against this effort seeking to retain the single family land use. The natural gas plant on the northern shores of Lake Union closed in 1956. There were a number of other closures within the district or around the district um, in this period, including Interlake School closing as an elementary school in 1972, Home of the Good Shepherd in 73, and Lincoln High School in 81. The closure of these key institutions threatened to destabilize the neighborhood and district, but preservation and revitalization efforts turned many of these potential losses into gains for the district. Historic Seattle took over the home of the Good Shepherd in 76, making it a multi-purpose community center. In 1962, the city of Seattle agreed to purchase the former natural gas plant um, south of the district um, and began the decade-long process of remediating the site to convert it into a public park. Gasworks Park, designed by Richard Haig Associates, opened in 1975. And then in 1982, Interlake School was leased to a developer and rehabbed and converted into a mixed use building uh, that's now known as Wallingford Center. And then in the 1990s, city planning introduced the urban village concept and a portion of the district was designated as an urban village. Uh, the Wallingford neighborhood plan of 1994 noted rising real estate prices and property taxes for the neighborhood as it once again became an increasingly desirable place to live. The residential trends of the 50s through 70s were reversed by the 1990s after the key redevelopment projects were completed and high density residential construction has increased within the last two decades along the south and west edges of the historic district. Next slide, Spencer. So since this is a National Register Historic District nomination, we wanted to talk through the differences between a Seattle landmark district and a National Register Historic District. Um, next slide. So we have this slide up on our first public meeting, but we thought it was worthwhile to share again. Um, kind of basic questions on the left and yes or no, um, if it applies with the National Register Historic District or Seattle Landmark District. Um, ultimately, listing to the National Register is honorary and design review is not involved. And National Register listing does not protect buildings from demolition. Next slide. But there are uh, incentives that are available for National Register Historic Districts, uh, including special valuation and federal tax credits. Next slide. Special valuation is a property tax reduction benefit tied to work done on buildings, uh, though they do not need to be income producing. Uh, and it does require design review. Basically, if you want to participate 
in the program and you're eligible, then you have to follow the rules of the program. If you don't participate in the program, you don't have to follow those rules. The Federal Historic Tax Credits Program is also tied to work done specifically done on commercial buildings and like special valuation does require design review. But again, if you participate in the program, that's when you have to follow the rules. And if you don't wanna participate in the program, you don't have to follow the program's rules. Uh, the Savinsky Grant and Preservation Special Projects grants are available to community groups to support work, planning, educational and interpretive efforts. Um, but ultimately, special evaluation is the key program that would be available um, to this historic district because it's available to non-income producing residential properties. Uh, the program was established in 1985 by the state legislature, and it allows a special evaluation for certain historic properties within the state. And the primary benefit of the law is that during the 10 year special evaluation period, property taxes will not reflect substantial improvements made to properties that are eligible for special evaluation and local, a local review board uh, reviews the applications to ensure um, that they are historically sensitive. There's also the community benefit to National Register destination. First of all, uh, as John mentioned, there were many volunteers who helped us with the research and this process of researching and documenting the neighborhood identifies the neighborhood's history, both positive and negative, and it can help residents understand how and why their neighborhood developed. Uh, and we also believe that supporting historic neighborhoods and their building stock encourages communities to retain and use their existing resources in established neighborhoods. Next. So we have a series of next steps as part of nominating the National Register Historic District and Spencer is gonna run through those quickly on the next slide. But before that, um, if you have questions about the National Register process, the National Register nomination, please um, make sure you include those in the Q&A box and we will start going through those. So Spencer, on to you. Wonderful, thank you, Katie. Um, so the final submittal to the State Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation will be in December of 2021. We're working through edits and we're anticipating receiving edits from the state architectural historian as well. Um, we're hoping to get on the agenda for the March 2020, 2022 um, Washington Advisory Council on Historic Preservation meeting. Uh, this would put the National Park Service review and potential listing by the fall or winter of 2022. Um, please visit historicwallingford.org for updates and additional resources and information. And with that, we have closing remarks from Rhonda with Historic Wallingford, and then we'll go into the question and answer period. Hi, I'm Rhonda Bush. Um, I'm also a board member of Historic Wallingford. I just wanted to thank you all to, for participating this evening. Um, I personally have a very emotional um, and personal tie to Wallingford, um, 60 years of my family um, has been lived here. And if you cherish the Wallingford community as I do, I encourage you to get involved um, with Historic Wallingford. And we're in a place that if, if we care about this place, we need to raise the um, awareness of the value of the historic properties here and the community and the people that are here. So let me encourage you to get involved um, we are looking for additional leadership and volunteers and always um, financial support. And we make it easy. You can go to historicwallingford.org slash donate. So again, thank you so much. And now Spencer is going to handle the questions. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Rhonda. Um, so we had one question that Katie is working on typing an answer to that will come up soon. Um, it was uh, a question about uh, liking the detailed information and will this be available on the historic Wallingford site? Um, and yes, uh, watching as the question goes through, but um, so yes, um, the historicwallingford.org, um, there is a copy of the draft district nomination that's currently under review by the state architectural historian. Um, and there will also, there's a uh, video of the past public meeting 
and uh, there will be a video video of this public meeting as well. Great, and I just um, answered that question and the link should be available um, in the answer Q&A um, that has the link to that presentation. And just as a word of uh, caution, when you open the document, it's very large and long. Um, so don't be surprised by <laughs> its length or get too intimidated. There's lots of information in there. Wonderful, thank you, Katie. Um, we had another question about, uh, are there plans to do any additional Wallingford areas? And um, I would say that uh, I suspect with historic Wallingford and, and based on the feasibility analysis of identifying other areas that are potentially eligible, um, yes, but I think as uh, John pointed out in his opening remarks, uh, there is a strong need for volunteers and participation in historic Wallingford to be able to support future efforts. Um, so I think for anybody who is interested in seeing this happen for other parts within the neighborhood, I would encourage you to reach out to historic Wallingford and ask how you can participate. Uh, next questions. So next question is, is there anything that we can do to preserve more houses and affect the recent changes in buildings to property tax uh, valuation? Um, so it's kind of two parts to that. Um, one, if you ultimately, if you want to physically preserve a house, um, individual city of San Seattle landmark uh, designation is uh, definitely the best pathway for that um, because that has design review and demolition protection. Um, National Register designation does not, um, but National Register designation does through the special valuation program that Katie mentioned provides a mechanism for property owners who are doing upgrades to their houses um, that meet the Secretary of the Interior standards for rehabilitation or property owners of rental houses within uh, the district or property owners of the low rise apartment buildings, um, the courtyard apartment buildings. If they're doing upgrades um, to those buildings um, to better serve their ongoing tenants. All of those are potential projects that can utilize the special valuation program and be a mechanism to reduce their property taxes for that 10 year um, time period. I'm just looking at the next questions. Oh, we've got a couple that are answered right here. Are you referring to the physical location, Spencer? Uh, no, you know, I was just looking at the question, how does the Wallingford district compare to the Roosevelt district? And is the Roosevelt district a Seattle historic district? And no, the Roosevelt district is not a Seattle historic district. Um, and so it would be a similar type of district in the sense of just a National Register um, historic district. Um, just double checking the Roosevelt district. I think I answered that it would basically, it would be the same type of district, uh, National Register district.
And we have another question. Do you know how many national historic districts there are in Seattle? And so, um, no, not directly offhand, um, but I would recommend, and I will post in, um, going to the State Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation to their wizard um, online site and being able to pull up a map there and then under um, register, you can turn on all the individually national registered um, resources and all the national registered districts. And I just posted the link to the wizard map and the questions under that. Um, we were just looking if there's any other questions, um, but uh, I think we're nearing closing in on eight o'clock and um, we greatly appreciate everybody attending and participating in the questions. Um, and we do have a quick count <laughs> on the National Register districts uh, that that there are 12. Post that. And I would just reiterate that Historic Wallingford's website, as well as the Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation's website, and we can um, post uh, the website information for the Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation. Um, in the question and answer box as well, um, has a lot of this great information. So you have additional questions. Um, you can look at their website, both Historic Wallingford and DAP's um, website, and I'll pull that link up um, really quickly. Spencer, am I able to post an answer to something that's already been answered within the questions? Yes. Oh, here we go. Yes. Perfect. Sorry. Oh, no um, so I'm posting at dahp.wa.gov is the website for the Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation where you can see everything within the state of Washington and all the other projects that DAP gets to work on. So I think that we, I'm not seeing any other questions that are coming in. Thank you everyone for joining us uh, this evening. We appreciate everyone taking time out of your evening to listen to this preservation and um, we will be keeping you updated through Historic Wallingford as to where we're at in this process. So thank you again. Wonderful. Thanks everyone.